Okay, so summer knitting plans are going strong because we have a lot of progress. We have a finished top. Hi, hello, my name is Allie and this is my channel where I talk about what I'm knitting, how it's going and what it's costing me. I'm coming to you today with a brand new mug in my collection. <laughs> I went to the Toronto Outdoor Art Fair a couple weeks ago and there's a lot of nice ceramics there and I limited myself to one mug purchase because I am a responsible person mostly. So I, I wish that this would come through better than I think it's actually going to, but this mug has this fun kind of like slight dimple here on the side as well as here. So just the way that you kind of tend to hold a mug, my thumb kind of rests right in that dimple. It's just really cute and cozy and I like it a lot and I love on mugs where you kind of get this gap between the glaze and the unglazed. I just really like the contrast. It's just, it's just so good. So this is made by a ceramic studio called Maison Stois, which I believe is based out of Quebec. So if you like mugs like this, go check them out. Also out of this mug today, I'm drinking good old standby Sloan Classic Earl Grey, an oldie but a goodie. So as for what we're covering today, we've got a few things. We have a finished object, spoiler if you haven't noticed what I'm wearing. We have an ongoing whip that you've seen before. And we also have, because we have a finished object, we have a brand new cast on. So I'm gonna get into all of those things as well as at the end, for those of you who like to stick around. We have a hefty book update today because it's been a while since we've talked about those and I've got some stuff to show you. So let's get into it. Okay, so summer knitting plans are going strong because my first finished object is indeed what I'm wearing. This is my Tecla top, which in my summer knitting plans video, I showed that I'd actually just cast that on and was starting to make some progress. And we have a lot of progress. We have a finished top and you'll also see when we get into new cast-ons, my plans are going swimmingly. So this finished object is the Tecla top by Milena Juhala. I knit the size two and this pattern accommodates up to a 64 inch bust. In terms of cost, this one was seven Swiss francs on Ravelry, which converted out to about $11 Canadian. Yarn wise, this was a bit of a stash bust project for me, which I'm excited about. I'd had this skein of Hedgehog Fibers yarns, my little swatch here, since October. I had found this yarn, I had gotten so excited about it, and then it just, languished in my stash while I ping-ponged around about what I thought I wanted to do with it for months and months. I made mock-ups, I rejected those mock-ups, I made more mock-ups, I rejected those too. It's been a process. <laughs> but just because it had been in my stash in a while does not mean that it did not at some point cost me money. So this skein of Hedgehog Fibers Oh So Fine, which is a 100% non-superwash merino, cost me $49 Canadian for the yarn itself, plus $11 shipping for a grand total of $60 Canadian, which brings us to a $71 Canadian project cost once we add in the pattern, or about $52 US. So this is a light fingering weight two-ply yarn. This is the colorway Budgie, so it has this really nice variegation of blues and sort of lime greens and purples with the odd speck of black. I kind of have a soft spot for this colorway and the name of it, in part because I had Budgie's when I was younger, and granted, I did not have the ones that are this color scheme. I had one that was all yellow and one that was green and yellow, but I can picture exactly the bird <laughs> that is being referred to. They're so cute. And I mean, turquoise is my favorite color. So we're winning on multiple fronts. So I was really excited to finally cast something on with this yarn to finally feel like I had found the thing that as actually viewer Suli put it, the yarn wants to be. And I feel like this is what the yarn wanted to be. Minus the fact that I actually have a little bit more yarn than I expected to left over. So I have this ball as well as my swatch is still completely intact. I was prepared to frog that if I needed a little bit of extra, but I did not need to. So I think that I could have gotten away with knitting possibly even a few sizes larger and still been okay with this because when I weighed this, this is at least according to my kitchen scale, I'm not sure exactly how accurate it is. This is about 20 grams left over out of a hundred gram skein. So, I mean, that's a solid fifth of the skein. That's not a tiny amount. So I really did have some pretty serious buffer here. It's enough that I'm like, now I feel like I should do something with this. I mean, this is a fifth of $60. Like this is more than $10 worth of yarn sitting right here. But if I do that, now this just puts me back at the drawing board of what do I do with this yarn again? And I think that for now, we're just going to accept this yarn has graduated. This yarn is no longer in the stash. This is the yarn that has become something. This can go in my scrap box if at some point it becomes something great, but I'm not gonna be worrying about that. All right, so before I chat more about this top, let me stand up so you can get a better view. So now this is my finished Tecla top. This is what it looks like from the front. And it has this really cute, really low back. I do find that kind of regardless how much I fiddle with my straps, it does tend to want to ride up a little bit at the back, but I think that that works 
quite well with the style. I think it's still very cute. I think it still totally works. So this top has I-cord edging, I-cord straps, and then this really cute little detail at the bottom. Now I do feel like it's important to note when I'm talking to you about how this top looks and wears. This top being present on this channel right now is brought to you by Fashion Tape. Like I would not be wearing this on camera right now without a little bit of help in the structural integrity department <laughs> because I don't trust this top. And I don't mean that at all as a criticism of this pattern. This was just pretty clear to me from the pattern pictures and the overall structure, just the, the physics of this top just don't add up to something that I could just like throw on casually and go walk my dog and feel comfortable in, you know? Like if we look at the construction of it, the straps are so long on the back and the back itself is so small that of course the way gravity is gonna work is that this top is gonna wanna kind of shift on your shoulder toward your front and start kind of skewing lower in the front as you wear it and as you move around. So I would say that's just something to be aware of when you're looking at this pattern. To me, when I chose to knit this, I was conceiving of this as like a PJ top, a lounging around the house top, a top that once in a while I will probably tape myself into to wear out, but I definitely wouldn't want to wear it in a context where I had any concerns about a wardrobe malfunction happening because in the absence of tape and or other reinforcements, it feels kind of inevitable. So that's something that I would suggest you be aware of if you're thinking about this pattern. It might be something that you would enjoy wearing over a t-shirt or another layer that would make it easier to wear it out and about. Maybe you just want to wear it at home. Maybe you want to wear it out and about and you just don't care. Great. Just be aware. Have a plan of how you expect this piece to fit into your life because I think that it could be a little bit trickier for some people. I did make a couple modifications to this pattern. So the first thing that I did, the most obvious thing, is that I made the straps into tie straps. So I have just heard so many times about stretching issues with straps on tank tops. It's just a lot of weight on a very small amount of yarn and it makes sense to me that this would stretch out. Because this top is made out of merino wool, it definitely has more bounce back than if it were made out of like a cotton or a silk, but there's still definitely a very real stretch out risk. So I wanted to do tie straps so that I would have the ability to continually adjust it over time as the straps themselves stretch and grow. And also just so that I would have kind of maximum control over the length of those straps and where the top sat in a way that can be really hard to know exactly what you're getting until you've already attached it. And I didn't want to have to deal with unattaching and reattaching. So we just, <laughs> we just went with tie straps to give us maximum flexibility. And I feel like it's a cute detail that kind of echoes the ruffle at the bottom of the top. The other modification that I made is much less obvious. So when I first joined in the round, I cast on the number of stitches for the back that were recommended, knit a few rows, I tried it on, and truthfully, I cannot remember whether my gauge was a little bit off or whether this was just a personal preference, but I was finding that it felt a bit bigger around than made sense. And it was kind of making the triangles of the top kind of sit in a not quite natural place on me. So what I ended up doing was calculating the number of stitches to remove from those back cast on stitches to reduce it by about two inches at the back. So I did have to rip out those rows that I did and basically redo the join in the round and just cast on fewer stitches that time. So in reality, I guess this is somewhere sort of in between a size one and a size two. I knit the triangles to the exact specifications of size two, but I then made the total circumference, I think, closer to the size one. In retrospect, I feel like I probably just could have knit the size one as written, and I think that that would have fit me a way that I would have liked. So if I were knitting this again, I would probably just do that because it would be easier. In terms of my yarn, after all the deliberation of what I was going to use this for, considering a million different things, I feel really happy with what this turned into. I feel like this was kind of the perfect project for one skein of a really special yarn. And I think that things that work well about it for me are A, the fact that it's plain stockinette. So it really does show off the beautiful hand dyeing of this skein perfectly. There were a lot of patterns that I was looking at that felt otherwise like good candidates. They were tank tops or sort of bralettes and things where I did feel like there was really good flexibility to adjust the length to compensate if I did find that I was running out of yarn. A lot of them were in ribbing, which I just feel like I, I just never quite love the look of a variegated yarn as much in ribbing as I do in plain stockinette. So I think this was the perfect pick for that reason. And also because like I actually have yarn left over. I mean, in my ideal world, I would use 100% of a skein on 100% of a project as I planned it to be and not have to modify, not have any extra yarn, not need any extra. <laughs> but in the absence of that level of perfection, it was really nice to not feel stressed about how much yarn I had while I was working on this project. I knew that the really low back was going to buy me 
quite a lot of wiggle room that there's not a huge surface area to knit of this top so it was really nice to just be knitting away on this and feel like yep I feel confident that we're good I have nothing to worry about and I mean speaking of knitting away this top happened so quickly this took me less than three weeks to knit which I mean for me like that's pretty fast I don't know if I have ever finished anything that quickly other than like an accessory that's knit in worsted or bulky weight. So it'd be knitting something in light fingering weight. I mean, yes, it's small. Yes, there's not a lot of surface area, but there's still a lot of little stitches at this top. So to just watch this fly by, particularly after having worked on my cardigan forever, I don't know, it's just very satisfying. I recommend, I'm like, oh, I'm ready to move on to my next summer knitting plans so much faster than I realized that I would be. And that's just fun. Okay, now I think I actually need to change out of this top in order to finish showing it to you so I can sort of hold details up to the camera. So one sec. Okay, we're back. So quick shout out by the way for this top because it's made by a really tiny business and I love them. So they're called Ursa Fibers and it's just two people. It's just the main maker who she designs the pattern that becomes the fabric, gets the fabric produced and then also designs the patterns for the clothing. And then she and her partner produce them made to order. And I just love their stuff. I also have this dress. Shout out Ursa Fibers. Okay, so back to the Tecla top. Just to chat construction for a second. This is knit top down, starting with these two front triangles, and then you join and knit in the round for a few inches. You can see the back panel there is quite short. And then you do a round of rapid increases to create this ruffle. Just bind that off with a regular bind off. And then you come back and add eye cord edging all around to finish it and do your straps. So a couple things that I wanted to chat about here. So one is that for this ruffle, I didn't honestly love the way that this ruffle was done and it's funny because prior to this I would have had no real point of reference but I had just recently been working on my cloud bow and it also has a ruffle increase. So in both patterns you're doing all of these increases at once like this is not gradual increases spread out across multiple rows. But what was different was that in the cloud bow those increases were done by doing a knit front and back into all of your stitches going all the way around to double your stitch count. And this pattern you're similarly doubling your stitch count but you were doing so by adding yarn overs in between all of your stitches and then in the next row knitting into those through the back loop to sort of tighten up the gap created by that yarn over and having just recently done both of these i just feel like i prefer the knit front and back method because i do feel like i can still see gaps at that row where those yarn overs are done like i do feel like the knit through the back loop does a good job of cinching up a lot of that gap but i just feel like there wouldn't be quite as much of one if i had done the knit front and back instead now I don't know that for sure because the cloud bow is kind of a funny case to compare it to since the cloud bow is at such an open gauge to begin with but just based off of what that looked like i just suspect that if i had done that here that it would have looked a little more closed let me know if you have experience with this and i'm wrong if you've done both methods on the same fabric so you have more of a direct point of comparison but i just feel like i would be curious to know whether this would have looked a little bit more seamless if i'd done that there are also a few spots where i genuinely can't tell if it looks a bit looser like like here for example does it look a bit looser because that's one where i forgot to do it through the back loop and just knit it the regular way and so i wasn't cinching it up the way i was supposed to or is that just one where that stitch was just a little bit looser than the others and so what i'm noticing is just slight imperfection and inconsistency in gauge i'm not really sure but just also the fact that you are doing this increase over the course of two rows like first you're creating the yarn overs and then you're knitting into them through the back loop on the next round it just does create that potential to forget to knit into the yarn over through the back loop which obviously is not at all a pattern flaw it's a human brain flaw <laughs> but i did like that in the method where i was just knitting front and back on the cloud bow worst case scenario if i forgot something i would just have forgotten to increase one and my stitch count would be off by one in this case where that would be like completely imperceptible Whereas if you forget to knit through the back loop into a yarn over, you would end up with a noticeable gap in your garment. You'd have like a little hole. So I just feel like if I'm optimizing for if I'm going to mess up, which I probably am at some point because most knits are going to be imperfect, which one is going to like reveal that error more? I feel like in this case, I would go with knit front and back. I feel like it's just a bit more forgiving. So I think that next time I see a pattern that's asking me to do this sort of thing, that's something I might keep in mind, that I might consider swapping in a different increase method that I just feel suits me better. And the other part that I wanna chat about is the I-cord, because I was talking in my last video about how I've never done I-cord before, and I was concerned that I would kind of hate it, the way that I kind of hate most finishy things. I felt like it was probably going to feel maybe similar to a tubular bind off, where it just, it doesn't feel like I'm knitting. You know, it just feels like this sort of 
peripheral little annoying thing that I have to do to like finish the knitting but it doesn't feel like knitting and I was very pleasantly surprised by how much I found that I-cord knitting feels like knitting. Like, first of all, you are actually knitting it. You're not using a tapestry needle. And so if you've never done an I-cord before, let me demystify for you because I had no idea how I-cords were made before I did this. And I feel like maybe I would have knit something with I-cords sooner if I had understood how like basic it is. So all that you're doing is you're starting with a very small number of stitches on your needle and that number will depend on your pattern but i think somewhere from like four to six is a common number so all you're doing is casting on those stitches to your needle knitting into those stitches and then instead of turning your work you on either circular needle or double pointed needle you just slide those stitches from one end of the needle to the other and then start knitting from that side so this means that your working yarn is now at the opposite side but that is where you're going to pull it from and when you pull it from there it basically turns this little tiny short rectangular stretch into a circle by joining those two sides so that's literally all you're doing you're like knitting your four to six stitches sliding it knitting them again sliding it knitting them again sliding it knitting them again and you're just doing that until you have the amount of eye cord that you want so when you're doing applied eye cord so you're doing it like on the edge of a garment like this rather than just sort of free floating the only real difference is that you start each of those rounds rows by picking up a stitch from the edge and then there's a part where you have to knit two together as part of this repeat but it's it's very simple to do and like it's definitely a little bit more tedious than normal knitting because the rows are so short but it still really felt like knitting and not like a silly finishy fiddly bit and i really appreciated that i also should mention speaking of needles i forgot to mention i sized up from a 3.5 needle recommended in this pattern to a four millimeter to compensate for a tight gauge so yeah very pleasantly surprised with the i cord process and also how my i cords for the straps turned out i'm pretty happy with them i'm a little unsure about my applied i cord if i did it like quite right i feel confident that i understand the premise of how to do the i cord itself but i was having a hard time understanding exactly where I was supposed to be picking up in the edge of the garment to knit that I cord into. And this was an area where I just wish that the pattern gave a little bit more direction on that because when I was watching video tutorials for applied I cords, they tend to show it. Here's how you do it along a horizontal edge. Here's how you do it along a vertical edge. But the problem with this top is that there's a lot of diagonals. It's a lot of increases and decreases and I was just really struggling to find tutorials that showed how to do it on something the actual shape of what I was knitting and it's also tricky because the shape of this edge changes as you go so you have this very sort of steady like equilateral triangle going on up top here but when you get around to the side you're down to a more gradual rate and so it kind of felt like as soon as I felt like I'd figured out what was working and where I was supposed to be picking up it would kind of stop seeming right as I got to a part of the garment that was shaped a little bit differently. And so I kept sort of running into this problem where I would sort of start to feel like, oh, I'm not sure this is like attached as closely to the edge as I would like it to be. This is really hard to show on camera, which I guess is a good sign because it means it's subtle, but you can sort of see like the, this hole here. So I would start to feel like, oh, I must be picking up too close to the edge of the garment and need to be like maybe going like a stitch further down to pick up into but when I would do that the further I went down the more I started to see these little vertical stitches coming up here like that's that's where the eye cord is sort of picking up from the side of the existing garment and going into and so I, I felt like when I was doing this eye cord I was sort of constantly ping-ponging between having these gaps or having these very prominent stitches. And I, I realize in the context of knitting, stitches doesn't really sound like it means anything. In this case, I'm talking about like surgery stitches, like Frankenstein stitches. Like it just has this sort of effect of dashes all along the edge that I don't think that it looks bad, but I also feel like when I see other people's eye cord edging, I don't feel like that's what it looks like. So I'm just not really sure what I was supposed to be doing that was different if I was supposed to be doing something different. It was just a little bit hard for me to tell. And another kind of factor to this was that in the pattern, as you do a garter edge, so just your very last stitch of each row is a knit, regardless of whether you're knitting right side or wrong side, because the top part is knit flat before you join the round. So the whole edge is alternating knits and purls. And in the pattern, it didn't specify what the pickup rate should be. So I assumed it's just one for one that I should be 
knitting into each stitch of the edge of this. And initially I thought, oh, this will be really helpful because it'll be really easy to kind of keep track and not miss a stitch because I'm alternating knits and purls. But I actually found that it created a bit of confusion for me because just when I would feel like I'd figured out how to knit, like the right place to knit into based on where I'm at in this edge and the shape of this edge, I figured that out on the knit stitch, but where do I go into the purl stitch? Because it's shaped differently on this side of the fabric. I. I just, I just could have really used more guidance on that aspect of this piece. Like this would be so above and beyond for a pattern, but if this pattern had had a tutorial of how to do the applied eye cord specifically on this pattern in the shape of this garment, that would have been really helpful to me because as someone who's doing eye cord edging for the first time, I just felt a little bit at sea. So I feel happy with how it turned out. I feel like it looks great. I just feel like there is room for my skill set to improve on this, but currently I just don't really know how because I don't really understand what I did wrong or why this little hole is here, you know? So if you have more tips on this or a specific video that you recommend for showing kind of how to pick up eye cord edging in a lot of different circumstances like knits versus pearls diagonals all these things please let me know i also think it's funny you can you can actually see this issue that i was having pretty clearly on the back on the inside edge because you can see like over here the i cord is very much all together and contained it's very neat but you can see in the middle we have this bottom row that's sort of separate from the rest of it and so that's where i started picking up further down into the fabric to try to get rid of this gap that i was finding but you can see how I'm doing that on the inside of the fabric, the eye cord is much less consistent. It kind of starts to fall away from itself rather than staying all together like it is here, which suggests to me that that's probably not actually what I was supposed to be doing. But I don't really know what else I was supposed to be doing. And I'm not, I'm not sure which it is. When I was working on this, I was trying to figure out, am I finding these gaps happening when it's a purl stitch or when it's a row that had an increase at the edge? Or possibly the row in between those where there wasn't an increase like is it a problem of the pearl or is it a problem of the increases because i was finding that it was like every other one where this was a problem so if you have insight into how to kind of avoid this kind of gapping without creating this kind of frankenstein stitch at the end let me know i feel like this is also such a me problem to have because this really this ties into my larger problem where i don't like picking up stitches and I think that part of the reason that I don't like picking up stitches is that it's often kind of unclear to me exactly how I'm supposed to be doing that. And I don't like doing things where I'm like, am I doing the right thing? I don't really know. Is this what it's supposed to look like? I don't really know. Like there's just so much variety to what is the right way to pick up a stitch based off of sort of where you are in your fabric, right? Is it a top edge? Is it a side edge? Is it a bind off? Is it a cast on? Are you trying to do this with it? Are you trying to do that with it? Then you add in the fact that on some fabric, it can just be hard to identify the part of the stitch you're looking for, even if you do know what you're looking for. So just all, all of these things put together, I just, I just wish that there was more very specific direction given in all patterns when it comes to picking up stitches because it often feels like you're just expected to know the right part of the stitch to pick up and as what i call an adventurous beginner knitter this feels like the thing that most consistently trips me up i'm constantly looking up videos how to pick up stitches vertically how to pick up stitches horizontal how to pick up for that, how to pick up for that and i just i feel like even with that i'm often still a little bit like am i doing it the right way i don't know so am i the only one who has this problem does anyone have like a holy grail tutorial of how to pick up stitches in all scenarios? If that's a thing, please send it to me. I would love to know and share it with the class. But yeah, eye cord uncertainties aside, I love how this turned out. It's so cute. I feel like it's gonna be a very good, just like PJ lounging around the house kind of top. And it was a really nice sort of like quick, easy palette cleanser project after the cardigan that took forever. So I really enjoyed working on the Tecla top. Okay, moving on to whips. I, I actually have absolutely no progress to show you on this one, so we're just going to run through it really quickly because this is my Cloud Bow Top by Reed Keys, and the reason that I have no progress on this one is because in my last video, I had asked about advice for adding short rows into a pattern that doesn't currently have them to make the bottom of a top longer, and I've made no progress because at the time of recording this, it's actually only been a few days since that video went live, so I've just started to get some suggestions, but I have not yet properly looked into them and figured out the math of what I'm gonna need to do on this top to add those short rows. So this is still here, this still exists, and hopefully next time that it's featured on the channel, I will have a bit more of an update to give you. I did forget to mention last time though that I was talking about this. In a prior update, I had noticed that on the sleeves, I was getting some very real striping going on with this yarn. And I was curious whether 
this was just an inevitability of knitting on this yarn in the round or if it just happened to be that I was knitting at like the exact right circumference to make this repeat stripe like that. And indeed, I found that when I went on to knit the bottom peplum portion of the top, which is knit in the round also, I'm not getting the same kind of striping. It's much more irregular than that. So yes, turns out these sleeves are just the exact right circumference <laughs> to bring out the striping in the way that the yarn is dyed and the bottom not so much. So there's not really anything to do about that or it's not it's not even it's not a problem. I like the way that the sleeves look. It's fine. It's just it's just a funny thing that I noticed <laughs> when I was working on this and I wanted to share. And I guess if you want to knit with this yarn and you are finding that it is striping and you're not liking that, I guess it's information that maybe if you choose to knit something else with it instead, you might not have the problem if it's a different circumference. So the more you know. I wish that I had made more progress on this. This really feels like something that should be done by now, but I, I have the problem where, and this is why I tend to knit more monogamously, is that because I had reached the point where I was going to have to ask for help and wait for feedback on this, I first cast on the Tecla Top, finish the Tecla Top, and then cast on what I'm about to tell you about as my new cast on. So as a result, I now feel very in that new project that I've cast on. I've just been very happy to just keep knitting on my new cast on and don't feel overly motivated to sit down and watch a bunch of YouTube tutorials and then do a bunch of math to figure out how to do the short rows. But I also don't want to put off finishing this for the amount of time it's gonna take me to finish the new cast on. So I need to kind of convince myself to sit down and do that. This is so close to being done. It's silly that it's not done. I would like it to be done. So I really would like to convince myself to do that. This is why I don't love having multiple projects going on, particularly when they don't really serve different functions for me. Like these projects are both sort of equally portable equally simple and kind of mindless to work on. So there's not a real situational advantage that would make me want to work on this at certain times over the other one. So that's kind of where we're at. It's kind of on hiatus, but maybe recording my next video will be a good kind of motivator slash deadline for me to get this done because it would give me a new finished object to wear while I record and that would be fun. Okay, it is new cast on time. So kind of big news if you've been following this channel for a while. I'm finally starting my Fausta Bralette. I would like an award. I would like a trophy. I would like confetti and fanfare. I finally sat down and did so much math <laughs> to figure out how to make the modifications that I wanted to make to this top in order for it to be what I want it to be. So this is the Fausta Bralette. This is a pattern by Low Key Bold Knit and it accommodates up to a 56 inch bust, which I would love to see go a little bit farther. But a cool thing about this pattern sizing is that it does operate on sort of two different axes. So there is both your bust and your under bust measurement because you're actually knitting a gusset at the bust that is designed to fit you perfectly. So previously when I've talked about this pattern, I had said that I was planning to knit a size 2A, but after doing all my math and sort of revisiting the size chart, I realized I think I actually want to knit a size 1A because I'm a little bit in between sizes, but because this pattern is intended to fit with significant negative ease, I feel like it really makes more sense, especially when it's a relatively minute difference anyway, to err on the side of smaller, because I don't want this to be something that fits looser than it's supposed to when it's intended to be a tight fitting garment. In terms of cost, this pattern was seven euros, which equates to about $11 Canadian. And in terms of why I've been talking about this pattern on my channel for months now, and have not yet started it, is that I wanna modify this into a full length top rather than just a bralette, and in order for it to fit the way that I would like it to, that for me means that I'm going to have to modify it with some waist shaping to flare out at the bottom. And because this is knit from the bottom up, that means I had to do all of that immediately before I could even cast on to even know how many stitches I needed to cast on. So that was definitely a barrier to entry for me. Like I'm not, I'm not uncomfortable with math. I don't dislike math, but sitting and doing a dozen different calculations when I thought I sat down to knit, is just not, that's just not the same thing. That's just not the same part of my brain. That's not what I want to be doing. And it just, it took this long for me to think about doing it and actually get it done at another time when I wasn't trying to be knitting. So hooray, we did it. Hallelujah. So to give you a bit of overview of how I approached this, why I was putting this off for so long, I wanted to use as my point of reference for how to make these modifications, my ribbed mock neck from Perneal Larson, because there's a lot of similarities in this design. Both are two by two rib and the raglan design of this 
has these increases that flow really perfectly along this one line to fit really seamlessly into the two by two ribbing. And when I knit this, I also decided to do waist shipping. And so when I did that, I used as a model the way that the reglan increases were done. I just figured out the equivalent decreases in order to do my waist shaping. So you can see the way that this tapers in at the waist. And here, in this case, I did both decreases and then increases again. So you can see the sort of perfect hourglass decreasing and increasing that's happening along that center line when I followed this specific decreasing repeat. So I wanted to apply that same concept to the Fausto Bralette, but they are not at the same gauge. So I knew that I was going to have to do some math to figure that out. Because for each time that one of these vertical lines ultimately comes in to merge at this center seam here, that is eight rows of knitting that make one of those happen. It's alternating one row of regular knitting with one row of a left leaning and a right leaning decrease on either side of that center line. And then you repeat those two rows four times. And when you do that, that's when you get this perfect join here. But because these garments are knit at different gauges, the length of an eight row decrease is going to be a different amount of fabric. And also the width that it's adjusting by is going to vary based on that gauge as well. So to do this, I had to measure my body to know what measurement I wanted that larger hip size to fit. I then needed to adjust that by the percentage of negative ease that the pattern recommends fitting because I'm not knitting to fit my actual body measurement, right? I'm knitting to fit the finished garment measurement that will then stretch with that amount of negative ease to fit that body measurement. And I then had to figure out how many rows of this increase or decrease depending on how you want to think about it because in terms of the pattern, I am increasing the number of stitches from what is written in the pattern, but because it's knit from the bottom up, my actual knitting process will be decreases. But for the purposes of figuring out how to cast on, I was figuring out how many stitches I am adding, from which point I will then be decreasing. So if I'm using the words increase and decrease a bit interchangeably here and it's confusing, I'm sorry. <laughs> but so once I knew what I wanted the finished garment size to be at the bottom based off of that math, I then had to calculate, okay, what is the height and width of one of these eight row increase slash decreases on this garment? at its gauge. And then how does that compare to the height and width of that same increase or decrease on the Fausto Bralette based on its gauge? So there was a lot of math. I will pop up on screen my notes that I took while I was going through this process. Okay, this measures this, and this is equivalent to this, and this is this percent of this. And so you, you can get an idea of what was going on. All told, this took me about half an hour to work out. So like in retrospect, is it like rational that it took months for me to convince myself to do this? No, absolutely not. But did I enjoy doing it anyway? No. Will I probably avoid doing it for a while again the next time I have to do this? Yes. But in the end, I concluded that three of those repeats are, I think, going to give me the measurements that I want. So I basically just, when I was casting on, took the number of stitches that I was supposed to cast on in the pattern, cast those on, and then I cast on an additional three decrease rounds equivalent worth of stitches. So I'm starting knitting to fit that widest point of me. And then once I've knit about this much, I will start doing my decreases. And hopefully when I put it on, that should mean that those decreases hit where I would like it to at my natural waist. Now, this is also part of why I think I was avoiding doing these calculations is that it should hit, right? Like I, <laughs> this is what I never like about knitting from bottom up. It's a little bit hard to try things on properly to trust that it's going to land in the end where it's landing right now. So I am going into this aware that there's like a little bit of potential for this to not go the way that I would like it to. So that's definitely where some of this apprehension is coming from. It also made me feel like there was a lot of pressure to be doing these measurements and calculations really carefully to make sure that this is going to be what I want it to be. And in the end, even if my calculations are perfect, sometimes there are just variables in the knitting process that affect things and the way that they fit in a way that we just can't foresee. So this is definitely not without any gamble, but I'm hoping that with all this work, I've set myself up for my best possible odds of success. All right, let's put this away and I'll show you what I'm actually knitting. All right, this is our Fausta bralette, or in this case, Fausta top, I think I'm going to call it because it's not going to be bralette. And it looks really small right now. It definitely looks like I did not increase to fit my hips at all. Um, that is just because I have this on quite a small circular needle. So the stitches are very much bunched up right now. Plus the fact that this is two by two ribbing. So it is quite cinched up right now. But so I am knitting this out of two strands of La Bien Aimee Felix in the color Winterfell. Now, this is coming through on camera pretty blue, but in reality, this is a very deep version of sort of a peacocky color, you know, a blue that has a significant amount of green to it. And I think that it is such a beautiful color. I love colors like this on me. Honestly, it's the color that I was wishing that this would be when I knit it. It's the color that I kind of thought that it was going to be. And 
that in fact I think the Knitting for Olive Merino in the color blue tit actually kind of is a little bit lighter but with a very similar greeny tinge but the matching blue tit mohair was much more just plain blue and kind of dragged this whole thing more blue. So I'm very excited to be knitting kind of the summer version of this top. I mean there's a lot of similarities going on in basically the color that I originally wanted this to be. It can sort of fulfill that destiny instead. So this is actually a lace weight yarn, I believe, but let me show you. It is two ply. And so it has quite a lot of sort of bounce and volume to it. Like I would not have guessed that this was a lace weight. And when I hold it double to do this, I feel like it is really holding its own. It's doing a good job. I did a test swatch in the first place to see how many strands I would need to hold with this in order for it to work. I was concerned that I might need three or even four but I feel like two strands is working out really nicely. Like if I hold it up single layer with nothing behind it, it's not like you can't see light coming through there, but like as soon as you put skin behind it, it's solid. So I think that the two strands works really well and I'm very grateful for that because this is not cheap yarn and I don't know if I would be knitting this out of this if I had had to buy three or four of these balls instead of two. So like I said, this is the La Bien Aime Felix yarn in the color Winterfell. And I have two balls of this, but I only had to buy one because I received one of them from my friend Amy and her D-stash. Shout out Amy, thank you. And even yet, buying this one ball of yarn cost me $65 by the time you added in the $11 in shipping. This is not a cheap yarn. By the time you add in the pattern cost also, we're looking at about $75 Canadian or about $55 US for this tank top, which I think I'm gonna really love this. I think I'm gonna really value this in my wardrobe. So that can feel worth it to me. Would it feel worth it to me if it cost double or triple or quadruple that? No, <laughs> no, it would not. So this is one where I'm very much acknowledging, like if I had not gotten half of this yarn from a D stash, I probably would not be knitting this out of these materials. And if I needed more than two strands, I definitely would not be. I should also note that the pattern calls for three millimeter needles, but because I'm always knitting tight, I'm knitting this on a 3.25 millimeter needle and that is getting me gauge. So I cast this on four days ago and this is the progress that I've made so far. So I guess somewhere between an inch and two inches. And I already have a bunch of stitch markers set up here that you can see, most of which are not currently relevant except for my beginning around marker. But knowing how much I have been putting off the calculations for this, I wanted to go ahead and do the figuring out of how to position my stitch markers for where my decreases are going to be so that when I reach the four and a half inch mark, when it's time to start doing those decreases, I don't then have another obstacle in my way. I'm like, okay, now I have to figure out where I'm doing those because I've realized shortly after I started knitting this, it's not quite as simple as just pick two columns that are on opposite sides of this tube from each other because the pattern later has this gusset that you create. So it's not like this is otherwise a completely symmetrical tube. I need these side decreases to align with where that gusset is gonna be placed. So I had to kind of read ahead in the pattern and figure out, okay, how is it having me position that? Where do these side decreases need to be relative to that? So that's what all these markers are. Those are in place now so that I can kind of go ahead with that without having to think anymore. I don't know if you can hear this in the background, but it is pouring rain outside right now. Um, we're having a delightful summer here in Ontario. Thank you for asking. But yeah, I'm quite enjoying knitting on this one so far. It's been a while since I've been knitting in two by two rib, but I really enjoyed it when I was working on this. I know that a lot of people don't enjoy ribbing and I don't love one by one ribbing, but I find two by two ribbing pretty satisfying. It may be that I get a bit sick of it by the time this is done, time will tell. Maybe actually when I get tired of two by two ribbing, maybe that's what will motivate me to go back to the cloud bow and finish that off. But as of right now, I'm really enjoying the rhythm of it and watching this start to come together from what is currently a little sweatband looking thing. <laughs> someday, someday this will be a tank top. Oh, I also have in my project bag, my this is my um, book holder <laughs> for when I attempt to read while knitting. And I was doing that really effectively when I was working on my Tecla top. I find that with some books, I can read them while knitting easier than others. With some knits, I can work on them while reading easier than others. Tecla top was a really good candidate. The two by two ribbing of a Festa Burlette is definitely more challenging. I find that I do have to do more careful looking once in a while to make sure that I haven't messed up the rhythm and that my knits and my pearls aren't offset from where they're supposed to be. So there is just a little bit more margin for error there, but I am persisting in trying nevertheless. I feel like right now I'm kind of more into reading than I've been lately. I've been feeling very much in a reading slump for a long time, so I'm trying to very much lean into it while it's here and while I can. And oftentimes now the biggest obstacle to me reading is just that I don't wanna not be knitting. And this little buddy is helpful in holding my book open. <laughs> Okay, that's it for my knitting updates today. Now, a few videos ago, I asked for suggestions of what to call this segment at the end of the video that I normally introduce as like, now we're gonna talk about non-knitting creative stuff. Like I, I was like, I, I need a better name for this. Does anyone have any ideas? And I would like to give a shout out to the viewer Fair Folk Dogs who suggested Off the Needles. 
and I feel like that's the perfect name. So it's now time for Off the Needles, where I talk about things that are not knitting, like books and writing and whatever other sort of creative interest hobby things I've been getting up to. It's been a while since we've done a book update, which means I have a lot to show you. So first we have two finished objects brought to you by two separate cottage weekends where I got to basically tear through a book in the weekend and it was great. First one that I finished you've seen on the channel before this is This Summer Will Be Different by Carly Fortune and I previously talked about this one as a new acquisition so it has graduated from acquisition to finished object and this is basically a rom-com and I have a problem where I really love a good rom-com but I feel like I sometimes just struggle to get into the writing styles of a lot of popular rom-com writers. Sometimes I just don't feel super sucked in, even if I like the premise and the characters. Like I read Book Lovers by Emily Henry, and by all accounts, I should love that book, but I just finished it feeling like, eh. <laughs> so I'm always a little bit reticent to pick up a book by a new to me author in this category, but Carly Fortune came through for me. I loved her style. It just felt a little bit voicier I guess than a lot of rom-coms tend to feel to me and I was just sucked into this book. I just wanted to be reading it at every moment. I'm also 100% a sucker for a book where you could describe like the setting is another character <laughs> which sounds so kind of like pretentious but I just really like when a story feels really specific to the place where it's set and so this one is set in PEI on sort of a summer vacation and I'm Canadian, I've done an East Coast road trip, I've been to PEI, so I could feel the PEI all over this book. It was really fun to have that as, I was gonna say the backdrop, but again, it doesn't really even just feel like the backdrop, it's so involved in the story, and it was just, it's just fun. Maybe if you like the idea of a rom-com, and Emily Henry like almost does it for you, but not quite, maybe check out Carly Fortune. I'm curious to pick up more of her books, because I really enjoyed this one. My next finished object has not been on the channel before, because I acquired and read it pretty quickly. So this is Fair Rosaline by Natasha Solomons. I bought this knowing absolutely nothing about Natasha Solomons and based just on the fact that I love a Shakespeare reimagining, a retelling, a spin-off. I love the original Shakespeare plays. Obviously there's also a lot of flaws baked into Shakespeare but that makes it such right material for retellings and reimaginings and I just find it so fun to see how different people update and edit and build on these stories in ways that reinterpret the original meaning or highlight potential original meanings. I think a lot of Shakespeare's work you can really read in very opposing ways, depending on what sort of moral or thesis or worldview you want to find in it. And I feel like so many of the stories are just so well known that they make really good sort of scaffolding for someone else to come and build something new on top of. So anytime I see something Shakespeare adjacent, I like immediately hone in on it. I am interested. And also, the cover is beautiful, so that did not hurt either. So this particular Shakespeare reimagining is based off of the character Rosalind, who you may remember from Romeo and Juliet, is the girl who Romeo is in love with for about two minutes at the start of the play, and then immediately forgets about the second that he sees Juliet. So this story is all about her and kind of giving the backstory of her relationship with Romeo, and it is a honestly it gets very dark. It is a very cynical, and one of the things that is kind of fun and clever about it is that sort of the first hint that her romance with Romeo may not be all that it appears is that some of the lines he's saying to her sound really familiar and it's because he's saying to her a lot of the same stuff that he's later gonna say to Juliet these are just his lines this is just how he operates so that's kind of maybe the first half of the book and then she sort of realizes what's going on and then the remainder and this is not a spoiler this is established by the the back copy she basically sees what he's now doing to Juliet and makes it her mission to try and save Juliet from Romeo and basically see is it possible to change the way that this story ends now I will say trigger warning for this book because again this becomes dark. I don't want to give a super specific trigger warning because I don't want to spoil things, but if there would be anything in the realm of romantic and sexual relationships gone awry that you would want to avoid, I would suggest doing a little bit more research into this book before you pick it up. Also, a thing I want to point out, just because there's already like an intertextual relationship going on between this book and the play Romeo and Juliet, I want to shout out the Broadway show And Juliet, which has a lot in common with this in the way that it's sort of reframing the figure of Romeo going like wait a minute are we sure this guy's a romantic hero and not like a giant red flag musical is a much much more like 
lighthearted and fun version of that. So if the idea of this is compelling to you, but you're not sure about the sort of dark side of it, I think that looking into Anne Juliet could be a really fun alternative or both. I think that part of the fun of Shakespeare reimaginings is the way that there are many of them. And it's fun to kind of have these different interpretations kind of pushing and pulling inside your brain and like informing one another. This is why I find retelling so fun because there's just endless ways to kind of fill in gaps or create backstories or reimagining what was actually going on, add different contexts that kind of changes everything. So I, I just, I just love things like this. Also I'll point out, you can see, can I, ooh, 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 there it is here. This book is called Vinegar Girl. It's a retelling of The Taming of the Shrew. So if this sort of thing is up your alley, also recommend that one. It was a good read. Okay, on to reading whips. We are now looking at Lies and Weddings by Kevin Kwan. So this is another one that's been on the channel before as an acquisition. And I just started this one. If you're not familiar, Kevin Kwan is the author of the Crazy Rich Asian series. And he also wrote a follow-up book after that called Sex and Vanity. And so I am only like 30 pages into this book, but my God, this book starts with a bang. <laughs> like, I didn't know a lot going in. I don't think I even read the full flap copy. I just read the little blurb at the top that says a forbidden affair erupts dramatically amid a decadent Hawaiian wedding in this hilarious, sophisticated, and thrillingly plotted story of love, money, murder, sex, and the lies we tell about them all. Okay, great, vague, don't know a lot, but there's gonna be a wedding. There's gonna be some murder, apparently. I was not prepared for the first like five pages of this book and the roller coaster that they were gonna take me on. I was immediately hooked. I cannot explain to you why the beginning is so good without really ruining the effect for you, I think, if you read it. But if you've ever liked anything Kevin has written before, I don't feel like you should skip this one. If you haven't read anything he's ever written, you should try it. I feel like he's, he does such a good job of writing stories with large cast of characters that I, as someone who am terrible at reading books with large cast of characters, actually can get invested in and follow what's going on and know who he's talking about. And I think that's a special skill. I also really like one of the kind of quirks of his writing is his use of footnotes. So despite the fact that it is fiction, he just uses them liberally. And there's something that just really tickles me about footnotes in fiction. I don't know, There's it's just funny to me. I just always like it. And I feel like he has very good kind of comedic timing almost in his use of footnotes. I just like it. So I'm not very far on this one yet, but it's very much delivering on everything that I have come to expect from Kevin Kwan, the sort of the glitz, the glam, the sort of tongue and cheek descriptions of it all. It's just, big fan. Okay, and finally we have book acquisitions and no one is surprised. Of course I have book acquisitions, but this time it's not even because I went book shopping, okay? So I actually got an email from a very kind viewer named Anne, who turns out is acclaimed author Anne Hood. So shout out Anne, you're amazing. And she told me that she had a book called The Knitting Circle that she was wondering if she could send me for, I mean, I think obvious reasons. I like knitting, I like reading, sign me up. And this is not her most recent book, so she also so kindly sent me her newest book called The Stolen Child. So I haven't gotten into these just yet, but I just feel like this sounds like a book that maybe if you here sitting watching me talk about knitting and also the books that I read, um, you might also be especially interested in this one. So just to give you a bit of a description, this is a book about a woman who is going through some really severe grief in her life. She's lost her child and she sort of reluctantly joins a knitting circle. And I mean, we all know knitting's wonderful. So surprise, this kind of starts this like healing journey for her through this knitting circle and the people that she meets. I don't think I've ever read a book that's centered around knitting. And I'm very curious to see how it feels to read a book that is centered around a hobby that has come to be such a big part of my life. But I've never really read about it. So I'm very curious to check this one out. And then her newer one as well, The Stolen Child, just to give you a bit of an idea, the little tiny blurb says, an unlikely duo ventures through France and Italy to solve the mystery of a child's fate in this moving page turning novel from a gifted storyteller. I feel like this is one also that I probably am going to need to lend to my mom after I read it, because in addition to being set in France and Italy, which is very much her vibe, it also is a historical novel. It's set in 1974, but it looks like it also ties back to some of the characters' experiences many years before during World War One. So I'm excited to pick this one up, but I also think that this is going to be very much mom's vibe. So you're welcome, mom. And thank you so much to Anne for sending these. I really appreciate it and I can't wait to get into them. All right, that's all I've got today. So thank you so much for coming to hang out. If you're not subscribed, but you'd like to be here again next time, please do consider subscribing. If you're already subscribed, you're my favorite and I'll see you next time. Bye.